Lift up the word and repeat after me. I believe, I believe. This, is this is the word of God. I believe what God says because it is impossible for God to lie. Well, we need to get that inside of us, that God does not lie to us. If we find it in his word, it's true. If we find it in his word, a promise to us, it's true. I said, if we find it in the word and it's a promise to us, it's true. And we don't need to see if it'll work. You know, we don't want to be one of those people who says, well, you know, I've tried everything, Pastor, and now I'm coming to you. I've tried everything else. I guess we're going to have to pray. And has it really come to that? See, prayer should be not, not be our last resort. It should be the first place we go. I want to talk to you today a little bit about fear. Ezra was a priest, and one day they, they built a little wood platform for him, and they gathered all of the people of Israel together, got them all together, all in one place. And he walked up onto this platform, and he started reading the law to them. And when he started reading the law to them, they all stood up, they threw their hands in the air, they bowed their heads to the ground, and they stood there the entire time that he read the law. And it was from early morning until late afternoon. And after he read the law to them, it's recorded in Nehemiah, the 8th chapter, and we use this scripture all the time, Nehemiah 8.10, the joy of the Lord is your strength. But you need to understand that that's what he told the people after they had been standing for hours hearing the law read to them. He said in Nehemiah 8.10, Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. Do not sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites quieted all the people, saying, Be still, for the day is holy. Do not be grieved. And they were, they were reading this on the first day of the seventh month of the Jewish calendar. And all the people went their way to eat and drink and to send portions and rejoice greatly because they understood, now listen to me, they understood the words that were declared to them. Now, if you'll go back and you'll read this story in the book of Nehemiah, you're going to see that when Ezra stood up to read, the scripture clearly says he read to those, now everybody was there, but he read to those who had understanding. He read to those who have understanding. And so this is, some, and it says that several times. And so this is something that we need to grasp when we read the Word of God, when we read His promises. Are we reading it with understanding? You know, I, I know a lady who told me one time, she said, you know, I've read the Bible through 17 times, and at that particular time, I thought to myself when she said that, and you don't have a lick of faith. Because I knew the lady, I knew her lifestyle and everything, and maybe she did, I wasn't judging her, but I remember thinking that. And then I thought to myself, wait a minute, how can you read the Word 17 times all the way through, read the Bible 17 times all the way through over a period of years and not have faith? Because the Bible says, in Romans 10, 17, so then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. But if you read all of the Bible in context, you're going to find that God talks to people who have understanding. And yes, it's true, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. 
But remember when Jesus was talking to the multitude one time, he says, those who have an ear to hear, let him hear. See, now we all have ears, right? We all have ears. But do we have ears to hear? Do we have ears so that we can bring into our heart what God has actually said to us? Well, I think one of the, the biggest problems that Christians face is fighting the good fight of faith. And in order to fight the good fight of faith, you have to get rid of fear in your life. Now, I'm going to ask Jerry Hodge to come up here. He's, he's a good friend, and I love him, and he can't hit me while he's on stage. So, Jerry, I don't want to put you on the spot and ask you which direction that is. I'll just tell you. That is north, okay? So, I want you to stand here. And I want you to face north. Okay, now, when he is facing north, all of his defenses, all of his, the way his ears are, are made, the way God made him, the way his eyes are made, he is receiving from everything in that direction. Are you following me? Now, now don't move, Jerry. Things can be happening over here. Well, he saw it. He's <laughs> he had a monitor. Okay. So this illustration doesn't exactly work here. But, it <laughs> but if, now they turned the monitor off. <laughs> but if I'm over here, Jerry really cannot see what's going on over here or understand what's going on over here because he's facing north. But now, if he turns and he faces south, he is still where he is, but he's at least facing the right direction. And he can see what's going on here. And and if he decides to, he can understand what's going on here. Now, here's the key. He cannot be facing north and south at the same time. He's got to make a choice. Are you going to see what's north or are you going to see what's south? Why? And, and I've taught this a hundred times. North and south are opposites. Now, in the same way, and this is lost in translation. See, when I ask you for an opposite, you can easily tell me, what's the opposite of north? East, hot, up. See, we all know these opposites, and they are opposite. I mean, you have two things. One's hot water, one's cold water. They're opposites. They come from different sources. In the Hebrew language, something that was not carried over in its fullness is Faith and fear. Faith and fear are opposites. Now, let's say, for example, Jerry is facing faith right now. He can understand God's Word because he's made a decision to understand God's Word. What can turn him away from this understanding? The force pulling him from the other direction, and it's constantly trying to get him turned around is the force of fear. If the force of fear, now there's two spiritual forces in the realm of the spirit. There's faith and fear. These are substances. God has not given Jerry the spirit of fear. God didn't do that. So as long as he is facing fear, he's not going to know what's going on over here. And he's not going to understand the things of God. Somebody can be preaching to him from daylight to dark. He can read the Bible 17 times. It makes no difference. If he's facing fear, he does not have understanding. He does not have ears to hear. Thank you, Jerry. Let's give it up for Jerry. Come on. <laughs> so what we've got to do is eradicate fear in our life. 
Now, that doesn't mean that you do stupid stuff. It's like saying, oh, I'm, I'm down at the zoo, and there's a pit of poisonous vipers. I have no fear. And you just stick your hand in the pit. Come on. I mean, God's given us some common sense. You know what I'm talking about. Don't, don't carry this to a weird degree. But you will usually find that the fear of something is worse or as bad as the actual thing. I saw a video the other day of a, of a place, I believe it was in the mountains of China, and they had this walkway that went across a, a deep thousand foot gully. And this was a very secure bridge, a walkway. But what they had done is they had put glass on the bottom. You walked on glass. Some of you may have seen this. And uh, I think there's two or three of them around the world. But, but they put glass. You walk on glass. And so you get out over, you know, you're a thousand feet high. I mean, that's, that's about where an airplane is in its landing pattern. You're a thousand feet high. And these people would look down and they would get paralyzed with fear. They couldn't go forward. They couldn't back up. Many times their legs, they had this one, one lady, her legs just gave out and she got down and she couldn't even crawl. What was that? It was the fear. Was she safe? Yeah, she was safe. But she could hurt herself. I mean, she, she may, for all I know, she may still be out there on that bridge. I don't know if anybody ever got her off. But fear was causing her to not be able to move. Fear will paralyze you. <laughs> Faith will bring you into action and you can act like a warrior of God with a sword of the Spirit and a shield of faith. My goodness. You know, this is why Jesus said, one of the reasons he said, I give you authority over all the power of the enemy and nothing. That comes from the old English phrase, no thing. No thing, nothing shall by any means harm you at all. Unless you let fear come in. Why do you think it is that back in, uh, back in the day where, where there was a lot of hand-to-hand -hand combat, that armies would paint their shields and they would wear horns and, and you know, the, over in, in New Zealand, they would do the huck, uh, you know, and stick their tongues way out and have all the painting on. Why would they do that? They, they would send those guys out first and scare the enemy. And the enemy would become so afraid that they were easily defeated. I believe that this is why in the, in the uh, Old Testament they sent the, the musicians out first. It wasn't because, well, they're just musicians. If we lose them, who cares? You know, it, wasn't <laughs> it wasn't that. It was the musicians were mighty warriors. And when they walked out onto the battlefield ahead of the army singing the praises to their God, many times in the Bible, the enemy turned on itself and defeated itself before the army of God even got there. See, fear is something the enemy uses. It's the force of darkness. Faith is the force of light. And what is faith? It's like our worship team saying while I go, say what God says. You want to have faith? Say what God says. Believe what God says. Do what God says. Be a God pleaser instead of a man pleaser. Why would you please a person anyway? Because you're afraid. Afraid of what they might say. Afraid of what they might do. Afraid of what they might think. Well, who cares what they think? If we start getting the attitude, I only care what God thinks. So, 2 Timothy 1.7, God has not given us a spirit of fear. Well, what has he given us? Power, love, and a sound mind. What does that sound mind mean? That means that you can think right. Yeah, there's a lot of people not thinking right. I uh, read an article in a uh, foreign newspaper yesterday, and they wanted, they said, 
We're not concerned about the leadership, and they named the leadership of the United States. We're concerned about all the imbeciles who put him in office. They said, we're concerned for the American people because they elect their leaders. And I've met their leaders. <laughs> well, that's the way it's supposed to work anyway. <laughs> 2 Corinthians 4.13, since we have the same spirit of faith. Now, what did we just find out? God has not given us the spirit of fear, but we have the same, what? Spirit of faith. Here's these two forces. According to what is written, I believed and therefore I spoke. We also believe and therefore speak. You've got to start believing and saying the same thing. There's a lot of people that believe one thing and they say something else. Now, Jesus, you all know how, how strong our church believes in the power of your words. Because Jesus said, be careful about what you say even when you don't think it means anything. Even when you just think it's nothing. He calls them idle words. Watch your idle words. What's an idle word? Oh, man, these, these shoes will be the death of me. What's an idle word? I don't know. Every time I get into traffic, I've always got some idiot in front of me that slams on his brakes, and I almost hit him. What's wrong with saying that? Because that's what's happened. Well, here's what's wrong. But by saying it, that's what's going to continue to happen. Because you are a speaking spirit and you call into existence what you say. You call those things that be not as though they are and then they are. You know, when somebody says something to me like, oh my, oh, I'll just, I'll just never get through this. And I say, well, you know, that's sad, but you're, you're, you're right, you never will. And they look back at me because they're wanting me to say that they will get through it. And they'll say, well, wait a minute, Pastor. What do you mean I'll never get through it? I say, well, I'm just agreeing with you. I mean, that's what you're confessing. You're confessing you're never going to get through it. You know, well, so that's kind of like shock therapy. They go, huh? Because they don't realize what they say. But see, right after Jesus said these little things that you say, you shouldn't be saying them, then he says, because... By your words, you'll be justified. And by your words, you'll be condemned. That's good. See, it's not always somebody else's words that condemns you. Sometimes it's self-condemnation. More scripture. Job 1.1. 1, 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was blameless and upright. One who feared God and shunned evil. That's interesting. Isn't that interesting? Then, now Job lived on this earth before the law was ever written. There's no mention of the law in the book of Job. So he was pre-law. And all those bad things happened to him. You all know the story of Job. All those bad things happened to him. But it's interesting, if you go and read what Job said, he said, the things that I have feared have come upon me. It's recorded right in the Bible. That's, that's a quote from Job. The things that I have feared have come upon me. What happened? He called those things that be not the things that he feared as though they were. That's fear. It's faith in reverse. See, that, I like what Charles Capp said. Fear is just faith in reverse. You can't be facing faith and fear at the same time. 
Now, what we need to do is we need to get out of fear and get into faith. You've got to recognize your enemy. It doesn't mean be stupid. Every single person needs to be led by the Spirit. Now, I know that right now in our country, there's a lot of varying views on masks and a lot of varying views on vaccines. And if you ask me what you should do, what I'm going to tell you is you be led by the Spirit. You say, well, that's, that's a cop-out. No, no, that's a truism. You be led by what the Holy Spirit tells you to do. Everybody's physical makeup is different. Everybody's job situation is different. You know, he may be telling one person to do this and another person to, to do that, okay? If you're led by the Holy Spirit, somebody may say, well, he's going to tell all of us to do this. Okay, well, that's fine. But you be led by the Holy Spirit by what he tells you to do, and don't be looking at everybody else. It's interesting how, to a degree, now not completely, take this in context, the fear of the virus with some people is worse than the virus. And if you can take a nation and shut it down because of fear, all right. 2 Timothy 2.15, be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness. You know, sometimes it's best not to say something. Sometimes it's best just to be a listener. You don't have to enter in to every single con conversation. You don't have to be the one that says, yeah, you're right, that person is a jerk. You know, people come up to you and they'll have opinions about other people. You need to shun those other opinions. And watch how you look. Because your body has a language. It's called body language. <laughs> and you can say nothing and still say something. You know. I've been picking on Jerry today. I'll just continue to use Jerry. Well, what do you think of Jerry? Oh, he's okay, I guess. <laughs> what did you just say? You're speaking with your body. You know, we must watch what we say because our words are like containers. And as they go out, they contain either faith or they contain fear. And it's not always just the fear within yourself you need to watch. You need to watch that you don't promote fear with other people. I think it's 1 Peter, I'll have to check, 5, 8. How many of you have your Bibles today? It's always good to have a Bible and check out the pastor and make sure he's actually preaching from the Word. Well, thank you. You didn't have to say that so enthusiastically. Okay, I think it's 1 Peter 5, 8, yeah. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. What does that imply? He can't devour everybody. He's not going to devour me. No, no. How, how, can he, how can he devour me? If I start getting into fear and speaking fear and speaking things that are opposite of what God says. That song we sang this morning was written by a good friend of mine in Rob Scott in Australia. He's the uh, worship leader for Margaret Court's church. Margaret Court's won more Wimbledons. She holds the record. She's won more Wimbledon Grand Slams than anybody in the world. And I've uh, been to her church several times. But that song, he was telling me one day, say what God says. Say what God says. If we could just get it in our minds to say what God says. 
What does God say about us? He calls us blessed. We shouldn't be cursing ourselves. I would encourage you, if you ever wanted to do it, to get a little recorder and carry it around with yourself all day long. A voice-activated recorder so it would only come on when you're talking. And then at the end of the day, listen to all the things you've said that day. And you, you need to think about that. That's what God's hearing. Oh, well. Psalm 1-1, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be, what? Like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. Wow. Isn't that good? That's God's plan for us. Now, personally, I mean, I know everyone has a, a different type of medicine that they take, but I take a medicine called uh, Psalm 91.1. Okay, you're supposed to go, oh, oh. It says, a thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the most high, your dwelling place. Why? Because. A thousand's going to fall here and a thousand's going to fall there, but not you. Why? Why? Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge. You made, you made him Lord. Okay, just to prove a point here, I'm going to take us over to Job chapter 3, verse 25. We're going to meditate on this scripture for just a moment. Job said, for the thing I greatly feared has come upon me, and what I dreaded has happened to me. When he was fearing it, was it there? No. When he was dreading it, was it there? No. When he was dreading it, it wasn't there. When he was fearing it, it wasn't there. But as he dreaded it and feared it, it came upon him. I, uh, I knew a pastor. Some of you actually in here may even know this man. He has gone on to be with the Lord, and so is his wife. He was pastor of a church. I attended his church for a while. And he wanted to promote healing in his church. So what he did is he faked his own sickness. Talk about fake news. This was fake healing. He faked his own sickness and pretended to have the symptoms of that sickness. And it was kind of a rare type thing. It wasn't your common everyday variety. And he did that for about a year. And um, then the thing that he was pretending that he got, he got. I'll never forget the day in G2M supermarket on the other side of the lake. I uh, was going to pray for him. Walked up in the supermarket. Now, I wasn't going to, you know, get the charismatic grip on his head and shake him around and throw him against the green beans or anything. I was, I was just, going to, just going to quietly put my hand on his chest and say, in the name of Jesus, be healed. And as I started to put my hand out like this, his wife says, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm going to pray for your husband. In the canned good aisle in the grocery store. She slapped my hand away. She said, don't you pray for him. We need this insurance money. See, and you don't know what motivates people. Sometimes money motivates people to go against the word of God. Sometimes, now this, I don't know how this guy got it in his head that if he pretended he was sick and then he got healed, then it was going to make everybody else in the church. See, God doesn't work on 
off of phoniness. God, God's not an illusionist. God, God doesn't do tricks. When he heals, he heals. When he restores, he restores. It, it's real. It's, it's tangible. Our healings are tangible. So we don't need to pretend anything. We don't need to fake anything. We just need to believe what God says and say what God says. Well, I have a lot of other notes here. So I'm going to give you a highlight, all right? Hosea 4.6 says, my people perish for a lack of knowledge. But if you read that in context, they perish for a lack of knowledge that they don't understand. We need to have an understanding. God wants us to have an understanding. Did you know that if you approach God's word with the attitude of, I want to understand this, Lord, help me understand this. I don't understand this passage, what it's talking about. Lord, help me. The Holy Spirit will reveal to you. There'll be revelation knowledge that will come, and he'll reveal to you what the word is actually saying. And the word is, is kind of like, an onion in some ways, sometimes it makes you cry. <laughs> okay. Uh, but there's layers. You know, you peel back a layer and you think, wow, that's what it meant. Then you find out there's another layer. I have had scriptures that I have preached on for 20 or 30 years. And I'm studying my notes and all of a sudden, a revelation of that scripture comes to me that I'd, I'd never seen before. You think, well, how can that be? Well, that's the way the Holy Spirit does it. But there's a lot of different types of fears, and I'm going to just mention some of these, and I think you're going to have to fill in the gaps, and I believe by the Holy Spirit you can. There's the fear of failure. A lot of people don't do things because they think they're going to fail at it. They don't do things because they don't think someone's going to give them enough credit. They don't do something. There's a fear of failure or that it's not going to be appreciated. And then they start saying things like, well, I'll never be able to do that. I can't make it. And then, then your words create what you don't want. With some people, it's the fear of success. I was talking with a minister one time many, many years ago, and he was just young in the ministry, and he said, I'm thinking about starting a church, but what if it gets real big? You know, he didn't want a big church. He wanted a small country church. But what if it got big? A fear of success. Well, if it gets big, God will guide you. I don't know of hardly any pastors that are saying, Lord, take these people away. <laughs> we need to understand this, that uh, fear is a sin. And worry, worry is a byproduct of fear. The scripture tells us that anything that's not of faith is sin. All right, all of this without a conclusion, telling you how to get rid of fear is just information. Are you ready? Yeah. Number one, start listening to the Word of God. Amen. If you've got fear in your life, start listening to the Word of God. When the doctor two years ago ran out to the car and told Loretta that I had three months to live, that can make you apprehensive. But what, and, and I had anxiety come upon me that I had no idea was there. I went home that night, and it was not like, let's go to sleep night. It was like, wide awake night. And I put on healing videos by Kenneth Hagin and by Barry Bennett. Boy, those Barry Bennett videos are amazing. If you, if you need to, he's got healing videos. Lesson one to lesson seven, it's all in a classroom setting. Barry Bennett, he's a, an instructor at Andrew Womack's college. And after listening to those all night long, the next day I woke up and I had just as much fear as I had when I started. And, but we don't give up, right? <laughs> Script, T.D. Jakes. We don't give up. No. Billy Brim. <laughs> Get them all in here. So I did it again, and I didn't turn off the TV at night. I, I left it going. I, I put it on. It'll only go three hours. I put it on a three-hour shutoff. 
I went to sleep. Maybe I went to sleep after an hour, hour and a half. I don't know. But you leave that plan. You leave the scripture plan. Because you're hearing when you're asleep. I mean, that's just a well-known fact. You hear while you're asleep. After the second day, same thing. It took three days. And I'm the pastor. I mean, I'm preaching every Sunday. I know the word. I'm teaching schools. I mean, I got a Ph.D. in theology. It stands for past having doubt, by the way. <laughs> it took three days. And on the third day, the apprehension, the anxiety lifted. It just, I mean, it just, it just went away. And then it was like, give it your best shot, devil. Well, what's the end result? You know, I did not realize, I did not know until last month that they had me down that I was in stage four. I did not know that until after they gave me a completely clean bill of health. They tested me. I mean, they ran PET scans everywhere. The doctor said, we scanned, we even scanned your head and we found nothing. <laughs> That's what he said. All right. 1 John 4, 18. So, wait. So, the first thing is, you've you got to start listening to the Word. 1 John 4, 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. This is something um, I think we all need to do to help get rid of fear. Start going... Uh, through your list of acquaintances and asking yourself, do I have perfect love toward this person? Now they, okay, look, they may be a jerk and an idiot and you never want to have dinner with them and you don't even like looking at them, okay? But you still have to love them. You still have to love them. Jesus laid down his life for you when you were a mess and me. It says, while we were still in sin, he loved us. Second thing you got to do once you start Listening to the Word of God, you've got to start speaking the Word of God. The fear, look, Proverbs 29, 25, the fear of man brings a snare. Boy, that's a big deal. The Proverbs 29, 25, the fear of man brings a snare. Wow. Romans 8, 15, for you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. See, fear, the Bible's going to tell you fear is a really a bad thing. Now, I know that somebody probably has done this. I don't know, but there's, in the Bible, there's 365 times it tells you to fear not. That's one for every day of the year. I mean, you could make a, a devotional book out of that. 365 days in a year, 365 scriptures that say, do not fear. Once you start listening to the word and speaking the word, then the more you speak the word, the more you're going to find that you're going to believe the word. Luke 12, 32, Jesus said this, But do not fear, little flock, for yours, but it is for your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. God wants to give you everything you desire. But he says, do not fear. Why? Because like when Jerry was faced toward fear, he had no interaction with faith at all. They're opposites. In the same way, you can't be going up in an airplane and down in an airplane. In, in the, air, uh, the last airplane I had, well, in every airplane I've had, and, and in your new airplane, there, there's a gauge that says rate of ascent and rate of descent. It tells you how fast you're going up and how fast you're going down. Your plane has one. Every plane has one or should have one. Rate of ascent, rate of descent. There's one gauge. Why don't they have two gauges? One says rate of ascent and one says rate of descent. You only need one gauge because you can only be doing one at a time. You're either going up or you're going down. If you're going up, you're not going down. If you're going down, you're not going up. You only need one gauge. Same way, if you're facing fear, you're not facing faith. You may say you are, 
You may be saying, I'm in faith, I'm in faith. Oh, Lord, I'm in faith. This is going to kill me. But, Lord, I'm in faith. I'm in faith. No, you're just saying you're in faith, but you're still facing fear. You've got to turn around and hear what God says, say what God says, and believe what God says. And you're going to find that what you say, you hear. Nobody hears what you say all day long, every single word, but you. You hear every word you say. You hear it. I'm hearing myself right now talk. I may say some things this afternoon. You guys won't hear them. But I will hear everything I say. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I've got to be speaking the word of God. And it's just like fake news on television. If you say something long enough, and loud enough, people start believing it. You, you've got to say God's word long enough and loud enough that even though the enemy's trying to get you to not believe it, you believe it. All right. And then the fourth thing you've got to do is you've got to act on the word. Faith without works is dead. You don't just say, I'm delivered. You act like you're delivered. What would a delivered person do? Cry and moan all night? No. A delivered person would kick back, read the word, believe the word, praise the Lord. See, and, and thank God for your deliverance even before it comes. You say, well, my deliverance hasn't come yet. Yes, it has. By his stripes, you have been healed. What you should be saying is, I don't see it yet. Well, that, that may be true. You don't see it yet, but you have it. You may not see it, but you have it. And you've got to start saying what you have instead of what you see. Speak the promises. Wow. Well, did you learn anything today? Yes. Do you have ears for understanding? Yes. Let him who has ears, let him hear. Praise the Lord. Stand up. You have something? Sure. S something that when he started his teaching and we're entering into God's calendar, the seventh month is the first of Tishri. When he said that, it was Rosh Hashanah. First words first words of the new year so first fruits first words so I just when you see that when you see dates in the Bible I know I'm sound like Dr. Loretta but <laughs> but of my heritage being Jewish you want to always look that up it was Rosh Hashanah and there's a reason why first day of the seventh month in fact Billy Brim when I was talking to her the other day and she said I really want this to be a Rosh Hashanah service in other words, we're going to, even though it is not on that specific date, the actual date is September the 6th. Six. Next, it would be next Labor Day, sundown on Labor Day. Yeah, sundown on Labor Day is actual Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah. But, and, and she wanted to be here that weekend, but because of it being Labor Day, it didn't work out with her family and right. everything. So, but she's going to be here the Thursday after that, mm -hmm. and it's going to be a special, special meeting. She has been planning on this meeting for a long time. Now, after, after she's here, she's going to be at Eagle Mountain Church. She's going to be up at uh, uh, Mac Hammonds right. in Minnesota. But this is going to be the unfolding of, of the vision and the truth. If you yeah. can be here on September the 9th. It's important. I, it's a Thursday night at 6 o'clock. One meeting only. One meeting only. But, you know, and then Matt said something earlier, and I know I shared this with you and Dr. Loretta. Words are important because the devil perverts words. Hebrew is God's language because we go into magic and what do we hear all the time? Abracadabra. That's an ancient Hebrew word that means I create what I speak, whether it's good or bad. So the devil perverts it. Now the word he perverts in Hebrew is when you do magic, ta-da, that means thanks, which is important to God. So words, I didn't mean to, but I just oh, no, ties no, just, in because... You just reminded me of the rest of my sermon. 
<laughs> well, preach, I'll sit down. It, but Okay, well, while the people are standing, let's put up on the screen, uh, if, video department, if you would put up on the screen Mark eleven twenty three. We just have to remind ourselves of what Jesus said. And we're going to remind ourselves of the scripture, then I'm going to dismiss you with prayer. Okay, Mark eleven twenty three. For assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes, watch this, but believes that those things he says will be done, he, what, what does it say there? He will have whatever he says. Who said that? The creator of the universe said that. So I think we need to get a grasp on this. In a, in a way to eradicate fear in our life is start saying what God says. And God says nothing but good things about us. And then we will have whatever we say and we'll be blessed. Isn't that good? Yeah. Father, in the name of Jesus, I speak your word over all of these people to pe penetrate their hearts. I call forth the blessing upon them. And I thank you, Father. In the name of Jesus, I plead the blood, no accident, no incident, no bad thing shall befall them. Today will be a day of blessing. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. God bless you all.